one of the privileges of being here at Brainstorm Health is you get to meet some of your heroes, and these two certainly are. So, you know, Toby had a remarkable career as a cardiothoracic surgeon and then leading Cleveland Clinic. Lori is an oncologist and, uh, uh, at Cornell and at uh, 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 Dana-Farber in Boston. And so you are two of the great physicians in the country. You've trained you. um, hundreds of physicians or thousands of physicians across the years. You know, when I trained, you know, we called it the Osler Marines, and we were proud that we were a Marine. We were upset that every other night we had to not be in the hospital, we had to go home. And in today's world, after the, the, the Libby Zion case, where you know, a, a patient had been cared for by a doctor who was fatigued and the outcome was not positive, things have changed. And now there are all these rules about how many work hours, how long you can do it. And you know, it's gone full circle in many regards. So you know, Toby, you've seen it kind of beginning to end, not you know, commenting that you're older than me. But well, I am. <laughs> <laughs> um, what do you think? I mean, where are we now in the spectrum of the physician work cycle? Well, clearly, you know, the physicians have been uh, really burdened by the huge changes that have happened in healthcare. And I think there's really four that have changed uh, in the time we've been practicing. Uh, first of all, the loss of autonomy. Uh, you're no longer the solo practitioner. You now have a team. Uh, second is the ACA came along and now you're being measured on your quality and reported and also measured on your productivity. Uh, the third clearly is the electronic medical record, uh, which uh, neither patients like nor doctors like. Uh, the, uh, and the, the, I think the fourth is uh, one of the really interesting things is the explosion in knowledge that's happening right now. And if, uh, you know, 100 years ago, the total amount of knowledge doubled every 150 years. Now it's doubling every 73 days. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's something like uh, 800,000 journal articles that come out uh, every year. Um, and how can anybody keep up with that? Uh, and uh, physicians, I think, for the most part, are feeling overwhelmed by all the changes that are happening and the vast amount of knowledge that they're expected to surround. Doesn't sound positive. Laurie, I mean, you see you know, oncology trainees in one of the, the emotionally toughest profession. Are they overburdened and overworked? You know, we did a survey together with our partner, Brigham and Women's Hospital, just a, about six months ago. And the survey was meant to measure two things, how engaged the physicians were in the mission of Dana-Farber, which is to treat cancer patients, and how, quote, burned out they were. And we were very pleased to see that 90-some percent of our oncologists felt really dedicated to our mission, were happy to be working at Dana-Farber. But the bad news was that about 50% of them were reporting signs of burnout, which is really a combination of factors. It's fatigue, it's stress, and I think most importantly, it's a feeling that you're not doing what you thought you should be doing when you train to be a doctor. You're not spending enough time with the patient. And that was particularly pronounced among fairly young female oncologists. So, but it starts early, David. It starts early. And, you know, we saw it at Cornell. We had a medical resident, wonderful, talented young man who was apparently perfectly happy with what he was doing until the day that he went to the top of Helmsley Tower and jumped off hmm. because of physician burnout. And we had a medical student who did the same thing. So I think what it's really incumbent on us to do, now that we have done some of the metrics, now that we realize the extent of this problem, which affects at least one in every two physicians, we have to figure out ways to make the lifestyle and the work style possible for our talented young doctors who we spent many years and a lot of money training. For every doctor we lose, that's a million dollars of investment that we lose. And that's not you know, the most important thing. The most important thing is that we have these talented people, these talented doctors, who feel that the purpose for which they went into medicine is not being fulfilled because they're spending twice as much time dictating notes, uh, entering things into Epic, 
than they are actually looking at their patients and talking with them. Just to put an exclamation point on what you said, a third of doctors surveyed said they would not pick medicine again uh, if they had their choice. That's wild. I mean, Toby, that, that list of things you mentioned, you know, most of it were created by legislators, by administrators. They weren't created by the physicians themselves, because no physician would ever create an EHR, an ER, you know, just to you know, validate that we don't build too high or too low, et cetera. So how do we get in the game? I mean, you as a physician led a major hospital system, and we're not trained to do that. We're not trained to think like the administrators and the legislators, but obviously we have to for our own protection. Well, I think you gotta start really early on, and you have to understand that you're no longer going into medicine to be an individual practitioner. You're going into medicine to be a team player. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the things that we've done is we've taken our medical school now and uh, brought in medical students, dental students, PAs, nurses, all in the same facility to begin to teach team play right from the very get-go. Uh, and that is a, a new concept that instead of meeting, having everybody taught in silos, you're not going to be taught to be part of a team play, and I think that will help that aspect of it. Then I think you also have to figure out how you're going to decrease the, if you will, busy work, the non-essential doctor uh, work uh, that uh, doctors are now having to put in. And so we've hired pharmacists to do things like handle the number of refills, uh, and all they do is do refills all day long, thousands of them that have to be done. We've now got some 1,600 physicians' assistants for 3,400 physicians, and I suspect the number of physicians' assistants are going to be equal to the number of doctors. Uh, we're trying to have everybody practice at the top of their license. Uh, we realize that uh, we can help with Dragon, which is a voice-activated um, dictation system. We now have the, the uh, ID card, so you just tap the, uh, your computer and you don't have to log in. All this saves time and helps uh, the physicians a lot. So there's a lot of things that you can do, but you know, there's also this thing, physician heal thyself. It's not just you gotta teach them tougher and make grittier docs. You gotta uh, support them. And so we have, uh, interestingly, only about a third of our doctors are even getting an annual physical. So we've given them a day that we expect them to take for their personal health. We've set up uh, when there's stressful situations, somebody dies or there's some uh, huge calamity on the wards, we've got a support system that will come and uh, professionals will help them see the team, see their way through that difficult emotional times. A lot of things you have to do to support physicians and let them be physicians. Two thirds of docs don't get an annual physical, that's wild. I was disappointed. Um, you know, I was reading an interesting piece in STAT this morning by Elizabeth Metro, who was um, in Baghdad uh, several years ago doing civil service. And she encountered a vet from, a doctor vet from Iraq who had been there, who had served this country. And she said to him, well, you must be really glad to be back in practice. And he said, you know what? I'd really rather be back in Iraq because going to the office, this isn't what I signed up for. I signed up to take care of patients and listen to them. I didn't sign up to do billing and routine tasks. So to Toby's point, yeah. we need to expand the number of physician extenders. And physicians have to be willing to, le to, get to, to give some of their control over to these physician extenders. So, and this happens at Dana-Farber because there's this macho attitude that I discovered among our faculty that we always wear our beepers. We're on 24-7. We don't believe in coverage. And, you know, I had a young woman, a very talented female oncologist who came to me and said, you know what, and she's a terrific oncologist, she said, I just don't know if I can keep on doing this because I'm never off. I go home, I want to spend time with my kids, but I can't because my beeper goes off or some patient calls me. And so I went back and said, we formed a committee to address some of these issues. And I said, we need to have a system whereby people can cover for each other. It is not realistic. This is not a matter of pride. This is a matter of keeping you all functioning, right? You know, one of the other interesting things we've been experimenting with was a company called uh, Augmetics and essentially take Google Glass with a, with a microphone 
attached to it. And essentially, uh, that goes to a scribe distantly. And when the, when the doc comes out, the, his, uh, all of his history and uh, for, our forms are filled out. And all he's got to do is check them and sign off on them. And you know, the increase in uh, satisfaction amongst the doctors has been really uh, very impressive. That's great. You know, I mean, obviously, this field started, you know, we had these pagers, you know, there were drug dealers and doctors were the two who had them in the beginning. <laughs> so that tells you something right there. Although I maybe, guess- Maybe, bo maybe we did both I if know, you look did. at the drug problem. <laughs> that the opioid crisis certainly crosses <laughs> yes. there somehow. Um, but we're selecting out for kids who do well in an MCAT, who have a high GPA, who can memorize things, none of which are necessarily skill sets that made any of us successful. We're not taking kids who can uh, deal with stress, who can communicate, who can observe, which are some of the most you know, uh, skills that we all need. How do we choose the right kids to, or students to go into medicine? I'm not sure I agree with that, David. I think that, you know, when, uh, I've been asked when I was dean at, at Cornell by several people, well, you must be getting a decrease in the number of applications you have because medicine is such a difficult profession nowadays with all of this regulatory issues and the amount of time you have to spend doing things that you don't want to do, you must be getting fewer applications. So I said, no, actually we're getting, this year we got 6,400 applications for 100 slots. And when I ask these kids, why do you want to go into medicine? I get the same answer that I got 30 years ago, which is we want to help people. We want to be of service. So I disagree that these kids, that we're selecting for kids who are nerds and who have 4.0 averages and high MCATs, that's part of it. But we are now selecting for kids who have compassion and care about- but Should there be a psychological patients. assessment to see if they can tolerate it? I'm not big on psychological assessments. I don't know, maybe they work, maybe they don't. Um, we need to keep close track of them is what we need to do because burnout starts when you're a medical student. So we need to provide, it's up to us, and Toby's done a wonderful job at that at Cleveland Clinic. Um, we need to provide support for them. We need to monitor them. We need to make sure that their senior leadership, because this is where it comes from, it's been shown that if senior leadership keeps a close eye on the junior people, those junior people tend to have less burnout. You know, one of the things, that, the way we do select doctors, though, and I think everybody that I've heard here is talking about how slowly healthcare moves. Well, that's not too surprising when you think about we, we picked someone who did well in biochemistry. Uh, then we um, sent them to medical school where they uh, memorized for four years. Uh, and then we made them interns, and they did what the resident told them to do. And then they became chief resident, and he did what the junior staff did. And the junior staff did what the chief, res chief of staff did. And so by the time they get to be 40, uh, they've been selected for not being creative or change. And they've been trained not to change, <laughs> and so they don't change. And, and so that's why you now have 13 years uh, from something being proven a, 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 a efficacy, and it becomes standard of practice. And, I, and so all of you I know are frustrated by the fact that you can't get the healthcare system to change. Well, my God, it's, it's not surprising considering who you put in charge and how you changed and trained them. Yeah. Well, it's interesting that, you know, particularly in surgery, um, I remember when the 80 hour work week came in and that was supposed to be a good <laughs> thing. But when I talked to my older son, who's a cardiothoracic surgeon at Mass General, he was a resident at the time, he said, none of us want an 80-hour work week. We can't abandon patients that we've operated on and then go home. And so what all of these residents would do is they'd be kicked out at, after 80 hours, and then they'd wait for five minutes and come back in. They'd creep back in to go see their patients. So I don't know that we can, that, that instilling regulations like you have an 80 hour work week are gonna work very well, particularly in certain disciplines. Cardiac surgeons are like that, sneaky. Cardiac, yeah, they are, they are. And I shouldn't really be saying this because it was, you know. There's some other issues with cardiac surgery. <laughs> no, it's not. Uh, they're too fluffy and soft. <laughs> Do you wanna lie it. down and we can talk? <laughs> um, we're gonna open this up for questions to the audience. So questions, yes.
for learners, and we get a lot of experience with this, of course, is the lack of diversity in our healthcare environment. And I say that because I'm sure, I know people don't know this information because I just got it from the AAMC and was really, really shocked. We knew that this was happening, but when you look at the 2015-2016 data, out of 52,000 students who applied to medical school, 20,000 or so got in. There are only about 1,300 af black African American matriculants. And when you break it down to males, there are like 600 uh, males, no, 567 males. But of that, only 271 of them were born in the United States. And so there are 148 medical schools now and we have made this big push to increase the number of medical schools. But of the new schools that had 1,300 new slots in the last 15 years, they only moved the needle on diversity by 0.02%. And so imagine what it feels like for a student who's sitting in a classroom and they're the only black male, or one or two, and the pressure that comes from that. And so, and then we start to see a lot of unconscious bias and other things. And so all of that stress really does impact their ability to deliver care and then adds to the pressure of them receiving care because they don't want to be a standout. And so I hope that as we think about what we can do and the importance of diversity, look around this room, there's some, there's some missing species here. Um, <laughs> and part of that is because when we get the opportunity to sit in the seats and begin to make the differences, we don't make the hard choices for ensuring that we have a secure pipeline. And I think that's part of the challenge that we're seeing in healthcare because the world is browning. And we know the data that really does support the fact that people actually will be more receptive to ch behavior changes and care delivery when they have people at least who can resonate with their story. Don't have to necessarily always look like them, but at least can resonate with their story. I, I couldn't agree with you more. And you know, there was a series of articles, seven articles in the Boston Globe recently looking at that very question, not only in terms of the percentage of African-American patients that we see, but also the number of African-American physicians or Latino physicians. And we are not where we should be. And we, you know, we took those articles to heart at Dana-Farber and have formed a committee that is going to address this in a very serious way. I spent so many years of my life doing this for women, for young women. Um, with a, a good deal of success because you've got to put your mind on it. And what we haven't done enough of is to, in, to be inclusive and have enough diversity as well. And so this is something I think we all need to devote ourselves to. Thank you for your comments. Yeah, I, I would just add that I think we've done a tremendous job in terms of females. Uh, it's now 40%. Not good enough. 40% of our, our, our uh, docs are now uh, women. But how many in senior leadership positions? And it, that's true. <laughs> but two hospital, just two saying, hospi just two hospital, <laughs> two hospital presidents, um, you know, half of my executive team was female. So, you know, they are certainly rising to the leadership positions. No, it's good. Toby and I are a, a, a class of individuals that is being pushed down, which is great. And we need diversity. I mean, you can't make decisions unless you understand <coughs> the patient and vice versa. And so it's a tremendously important point. Other questions from the audience? Yes. Back there. Hi, I'm Yoki Ness, Google CTO. Um, so in Silicon Valley, there are a lot of schools that are sort of being innovative using the entrepreneurial culture. It seems like medical school might be ripe for that as well. Are there dramatic ways that you can imagine working, things that you can remove, things you can add, or actually just do it differently to make it better for where we're going? Actually, l l let me just answer that. One of the things that we're really excited about is our, our, our partnership with Microsoft. And Microsoft HoloLens uh, we have incorporated in, and we're now teaching anatomy without a cadaver. Interestingly, the other day, I'm walking around a heart that's sitting out in space. And they say, Toby, stick your head in. 
And so I go like this, my head's in the left ventricle, and I'm looking at the outflow track uh, of the heart. Never as 40 years as cardiac surgeon did I ever have that view of the heart. Uh, and we think that this is going to allow us to teach better, uh, have the understanding of the anatomy better, uh, and th we need to bring that sort of technology into uh, the teaching of physicians and healthcare providers. Think about, for example, how incredibly boring it must be for a doctor to teach medical students or a professor to teach medical students organic chemistry year after year after year after year, the same thing, the Krebs cycle doesn't change. By the way, taking it is not fun either. No, that's true. Right. But I mean, you could take it at your own, uh, uh, your own uh, time and, and learn it on, uh, with uh, a different modality of, of learning. So uh, I think we have to bring new technology in and we're doing that in our new healthcare education. So most um, teaching hospitals have simulators, which is really terrific. So you can get your whole team together, the anesthesiologist, the surgeon, the nurses, the nurse assistants, the scrub nurses, and you can practice a procedure before you do it. You simulate it in a simulator lab. And medical students now, certainly at Cornell and I'm sure everywhere, are now using those simulators all of the lectures are now online, so students can take their own time learning some of the material as well. And there's less emphasis on memorizing because it's so easy to look up things now as opposed to when I was in medical school or Toby was in medical school where you really had to do a lot of memorization. Last question, we have a minute left. Yes. <clears throat> um, we, we just got done talking about you know, innovation in, in healthcare IT investments and the, the things like that. My, my question is, is the relationship of health systems and innovation. You get the feeling when you talk to some health systems that they're blockbusters in a Netflix era, right? But there are some health systems that are changing the way they behave. So I guess I, I'm curious as leaders of these large organizations, curious about how you think about change in, in very large institutions. Just curious on that. Well, I think, you know, change, uh, frankly, happens, I think, around leadership. Um, and I don't think that you find um, that change uh, and a major change is going to happen without uh, engagement of the CEO in that, that change. And um, that is, takes a lot of time. Uh, and healthcare systems move slowly over that period of time. But you really have got to engage uh, the leadership uh, to drive that. And I think that's probably true of most big organizations. This is called CEO burnout. <laughs> Seriously. <clears throat> when I was at Cornell, <clears throat> one of the tasks I set myself to begin with was making things better for women. And there is one nice thing about being the boss. You can just say, just do it. We built a child care center. We in put in place automatic suspension of tenure. We gave six weeks of paid maternity leave. <coughs> We had no chairs of any clinical departments who were women. Now there are two, and so on and so forth. You have to put your money also where your mouth is. So you have to provide funding to enable talented young people to pr be promoted and to oversee and mentor their careers. Mentorship is absolutely critical. Thank you all for an enlightening session, and hopefully this issue will be continually talked about in the hallways. Thank you. <laughs>